did really well, but Here Comes the Boom, which everybody I talk to loves Here Comes the Boom, but uh, it did not do well. And I love that movie. Yeah. Everybody, I don't know any, you know, as a matter of fact, I was at the gym and, uh, and, and we were talking about, uh, I had taken this funny picture with Boz when he was doing the, the rear naked choke on me, mm -hmm. right? So I was showing that picture around because, the, you know, they're all big MMA fans. And uh, we started talking about Here Comes the Boom. And all of a sudden it went from uh, just me and this other person talking about it. All of a sudden we had a group of about five or six people talking about Here Comes the Boom. Everybody had good things to say about it, but yet it commercially didn't do well enough for well, them to get a second movie. I think it has to do with marketing. It really. does. Because, I mean, like, our games, I think, are amazing. But if people don't know about them, like, I'll be honest. I went to see Here Comes the Boo because my boss was in it. Right. I knew him. I didn't want to run into him and say, and he'd say, how do you like the movie? I'm like, oh, I didn't know. <laughs> um, so I brought my youngest daughter. And I don't know, she's, well, she's still a teenager. So and we both really liked it. But I only went to see it because I knew him. Right. And so that's the thing. It, and it's kind of like with the games that we have. They're really great, but if you don't know about them then you don't go. And I think that whole thing about, you know, build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your door is bullshit. Can I it swear? is. Can I swear? Yeah, yeah. It's too yeah. late now. It's too late now. <laughs> it, is, it is total, it is total BS. And I think it's one of the biggest myths in business that has probably destroyed more businesses because people are saying, I am better at this or I have built a better mousetrap. There's nobody coming. All I'm hearing is crickets. Right. It's because it's, you know, uh, it was, what's his name? Emerson, Waldo Emerson something. Ralph Waldo Emerson. He, I don't think he was a business guy. I think he was, I guess technically yeah. he was because he was an author, but he wasn't a traditional business person. Like, you know, for instance, you guys are, right? You started from scratch. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I think he said something that sounded good. You know, he, he wrote he wrote essays, poems, and a couple of books, I think. Mm -hmm. But I think poems and essays were his big things. And he wrote something that is very poetic. It sounds great. Right. But it is total BS. And in... in then of course there was that movie, you know, Fields of Dreams. If you build it, they will come. That's that's right, it only right. works in the movie <laughs> when you have a hundred million dollars backing that movie. But it is all marketing, yes. by the way. It is. I think that when um, uh, Boz, this is for you. So <laughs> since we're, you know, the, the warm up. But anyway, so the whole deal was, I think that the reason that Here Comes the Boom didn't do as well is because it wasn't your typical Kevin James movie. It was. You know, it was him in this very physical role, yeah. and I don't know if that people just didn't get that. They didn't like him in it. They just they're like, oh, this guy can't really be an MMA guy. You know, I don't know what it was. It was a disconnect. That's the only thing I can think of because it was done well. The acting was good. It had a great cast. Well, I think they think of him more as a comedian, yeah. slapstick comedian, and it was more kind of a drama. And it, like I said, it was really good. But I think that kind of goes back to like the issue we face and every business faces, whether it's a major studio or a gaming company like us, is how do you get people to A, know that you exist, and then B, know that you're really great. It's not enough to be really great. And and then I think you came up with another thing, which is kind of judging you against expectations. Right. So people may say, well, yeah, it was a good movie, but they came expecting some kind of slapstick comedy. It's the same thing like we make educational games and people will say, well, yeah, but it's not like Super Mario Brothers or it's not like Grand Theft Auto, but kids aren't playing that in the classroom. Right. So I think that's kind of the same thing that happened with, with that movie as sometimes happens to us is that people say, oh yeah, these if they looked at it as, as an educational game, just like if they looked at that movie as, oh, it's kind of a nice drama, kind of a Mighty Ducks type of thing. Right. They would have really liked it as opposed to expecting it to be, you know, what, you know, what are some of those movies that Julie watches that I hate? That <laughs> you know, like those teen movies. Yeah, yeah, or yeah, no, right. I mean, like a real slapstick comedy. Yeah. Adam Sandler. Well, like Adam yeah. Sandler, yeah. grown ups. Yeah. 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 I but mean, go ahead. You know what I would say, though, because I, not I haven't seen the movie. I got three small children, so if it's not animated, I haven't seen it <laughs> um, in the last nine plus years now. But, you know, what I think, though, too, that we go up against when it comes to educational games is there's so many out there, mm -hmm. and so many of them suck and so you're not just going up against these great expectations you have but people are like oh yeah i've tried all there's so many bad ones out there that you Ooh, have to rise above that noise right. yeah. and right. that i think is as much a challenge if not more than that comparison to you know this huge blockbuster right. game 
it's more, well, yeah, but all these other games are bad, so really, do I really, am I going to take the time and try out yours, and really, are you that different from all these other ones? That's a really good point. That's a really good point. Well, you know what? So, so let's jump into this. And I'm I'm here today with Maria Ortiz and Doctor 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 Anne Maria Demars. And so, why don't you guys tell us a little bit about your backgrounds? As far as you have a, a, a PhD in um, my doctorate's in educational psychology, okay. and I specialized in applied statistics and psychometrics. Smarter than I look. Smarter than you look. A lot of math in that. Yes. Yes. All right. And Maria, tell us a little bit about uh, you. Yeah, I come from a background of the exact opposite. I majored in journalism, and I worked in media for a decade um, where I did do sports journalism, so there was some math, but not nearly as much as <laughs> applied statistics. And, and so tell us your roles here at Seven Generation Games. So I am CEO of Seven Generation Games. I do the nine million things we both do that involve running a startup. Um, primarily, my, some of my main focus is game design, uh, fundraising, business development. Um, I basically lead our creative and business side teams, our administrative teams, um, and I leave a lot of the coding leadership up to. To the coder. Right, and I am the president, and my role is primarily on the development part of it, and with a lot of focus on math and what works because there, like Maria said, there's a lot of educational games out there that are not effective. That people just throw it up and say, "Oh, it teaches coding skills because if they do this, then that happens." And of course, that's ridiculous. And so I do a lot of building in the math that what would make sense. You know, right. I try. I put a lot of my time into thinking about if I were a kid and I didn't want to learn this, what would make me want to do it? And I do a lot in in data analysis. So every time so. Uh, uh, player clicks a number or plays the game, we record that to see what makes kids keep playing, mm. are they really learning math better, we include problems not like, I, I always say this, that you know, I've used math my whole life, I taught right. math from middle school all the way through doctoral students, and never yet has someone run up and said, quick, what's the letter times eight, and then run out again, and yet we teach as if that's how it works, right? Right, right? And so we've got all these games that are like shooting in math, shooting in, you know, shooting in spelling. So instead, our games are things like, if you had to meet another tribe and they were six days right away, where would be the fairest place for the two of you to meet? And Oh, you know, that's interesting. Ride your hunter to that spot. Right. And if you ride to the wrong spot, if you ride instead of, you know, three days, which is a half, to two days, then there's you a die. sad video that plays and you <laughs> die, you know. And there's this other, this disembodied voice, we waited for you for days, but you never came, and a bear killed you. <laughs> you know, uh, what's interesting is I think that makes a lot more sense because, first of all, it, it is math that is applicable to the real world. Because how many times, hey, let's meet, you know, let's go out to dinner. Great, where do you want to go? Let's play, let's find some place right. halfway. Right. Very real world stuff. And of course, uh, you know, people do get lost here in LA and, and <laughs> consumed by traffic. That's a different story. But <laughs> but the, the other thing is, is that that's also a great video game in the sense that that's what happens in a typical video game. Um, you couldn't, you, you know, you, you weren't able to meet that expectation. So you disintegrate it or right. you you know you have to respawn or whatever it's called I, I like that i like that okay so seven generation games you said are is four years old now yes mm -hmm. and who is your primary market we kind of have two two markets okay. and i people will say you shouldn't do that but we think that they actually do kind of feed into sure. each other so we're going after schools because that's where you're going to reach the most kids that's where you're going to get the most impact is if you have it in millions of classrooms, you know, in playing by millions of kids in, in classrooms across this country, and even now we have bilingual games, so it could be literally classrooms around uh, the world. And that's our one of our focuses, but I also think that we've started shifting more towards the individual consumer focus as well, because parents really want to do what's best for their kids, and, and sometimes the school educational process is a long sale. Right. Um, and, and also when they look at it, the decisions that are being made is, if, an administrator's looking at it, and they're looking at it for what's best for thousands of kids, you know, not just a single one. When you're a parent, you're looking at it for, this is my kid, this is my... I, I think that I'm saying we gotta oh. move out of here because I bet it's after oh. 10, I saw somebody looking at oh. Just hit the pause button and we'll be right back. Yeah. 
we had to move because somebody else needed the room that we were in and we're going to pick up right where we left off. Maria, you were explaining the two markets that you service. And interestingly enough, one of the things that you said, because this is uh, very true, a lot of marketers will say, oh, you're, you shouldn't split your resources and serve two markets, but talk about your two markets. Right, so we have the school market, which is where we think we can reach the most amount of kids in one way, because you have it actually in your classroom. That's, you know, millions of children across not just this country, but now we have bilingual games. So literally we can play in a couple of different markets. Um, so that's one market, and that's obviously a huge market, but we also think, and this is where it kind of gets into the consumer market, because you look at it, parents are looking at buying apps for their kids, right? right. I mean, 70% of parents say they'll spend money on apps, and the biggest, the biggest differentiator in making that decision is educational value. Mm. We offer that. And so when you talk about administrators, administrators have to look at a lot of different things. And I'm not saying they don't care what's best for the kids, but they look at decisions for what, how this will impact the thousands of kids, what we best need to serve, what we're using, and we obviously think our product is in that. But from a parent, they look at it as, this is my one kid, or right. three kids, or however many kids you have. What can I do for them? And so it's a much different purchasing decision. And you also look into it, parents will say to schools, hey, I bought this, you should check it out for my kid. And my daughter will come home and say, hey, we're using this software at school, we're using this, can, you, can we play it at home? And I will say yes, because it's almost been vetted. So you kind of have these two markets that are feeding into each other. You know, the parents say to the school, you should get it, the kids come home from school and say that you should get it. So we're actually using them both to leverage, uh, to, improve, to scale in both markets. So. I like that, I like it. You know, interestingly enough, because, uh, something that you were talking about that kind of gave me an idea you know all of my kids uh, have first of all gone to public school uh, and sooner or later there's a fundraising mechanism to it right you know so so the the, the kids are asked to you know hey chocolates magazine subscriptions uh, wrapping paper uh, for the most part stuff that Nobody really cares about it. Right. Nobody right? really wants it. Nobody wants it. You're buying wrapping paper in, in like March or June <laughs> or something. And, and, and it, you know, by the time Christmas rolls around or the holidays roll around, you can't find the wrapping exactly. paper. And face it, we all love chocolate, but nobody needs more chocolate. But my thought was that might be a great play for you guys in the sense of using your games as a fundraiser and you know, so, so the kids' family can pay for the games to get them in the school kind of a thing. Just a, just a brainstorm uh, idea. But, okay, so I love that. And, and the, what makes your two markets kind of nice is that they, they do overlap each other, right? It makes it nice because you can market to one and it's going to um, help the other or, and vice versa. And, and a lot of those... Uh, what do you call it, uh, decision makers go to the same meetings. The parents go to the PTOs right. and, and the PTAs. And, and so you have a lot of, uh, what do you call it, uh, mixed demographics there that, again, it's gonna help a lot. I wanna talk about the way you guys got started. You're a four-year-old company, you got funded in a very unique way. I wasn't aware that you could get funded like this. So talk about how you got started. Well, a lot of our funding came from Small Business Innovation Research Awards. So SBIR is a program for products that seem like they might be commercially viable. So the first thing about an SBI award is it has to result in a commercial product. Okay. The second thing is it has to have a research component to it. So you can't get an SBI award and say, I want to open a yogurt shop or okay. I want to open a business that provides counseling in the area for drug addicted youth. That's probably a good thing, but it's not research. So the type of research we've done is looking at can you replace math class with a game two or three days a week? Mm. Or can you add a game that combines math and social studies a couple times a week? Or can you take a game that teaches math and social studies and put it in your after school program? If you do that, will kids' math scores go up? Right. So the big question that our research asked is, will kids' math scores actually improve from this? And so if you have a component like that, where there's actually a research and development to it, then it can be a, an option for small business funding. Now, don't ever believe those ads on TV, the government wants to give you money, and I don't know of any grant money that's going unclaimed. Every time, you know, I always would Elvis and shoot my TV every time I see that. These grants, and again, Maria talks about being vetted, right. um, less than 15% get vetted for a phase, get approved for a phase one. Okay. So it's between three and 15% a lot of times. 
And out of those, they won't all get for a phase two. So like the, the grant we're under, 7% of those who applied got funded. Wow. So it's really competitive. And what you need to do in that is document that there's a need for this. You know, that one of the things we always say is that so many parents think their kids are at grade level in math or they're proficient in math, but 74% of kids in this country graduate high school without having met state math standards. So there's a huge need. And then you have to, in that show design, how you are going to meet that need. Where's the research showing that this work? How are you going to evaluate it? So right. like with our games, We've had schools that will do a pretest of how well kids are doing on, on the parts of math, the math standards taught in our games, right. and then a post test. And we have other schools that don't play the games that do the same test, and then we can compare how much the kids who played the games improved. And generally, it's two to, between two and four times as much. Wow. Wow. And you know what? To me, that makes sense because gamification works everywhere. I mean, it's, it's big in the corporate world now. It's always worked. You know, interestingly enough, uh, my oldest boy who struggled in math um, and he found a video game and I can't remember what operating system was but this is going back he's he's 30 now and so he might have been like 12 at the time so. like number my yeah. math class <laughs> sure. this, this is this is oh this was Stargate he had found the oh, yeah. Stargate game and and you know, there was no instructions and he just messed with it and messed with it till he could figure it out. Because first of all, it, you know, it was interesting to him. Uh, he, it, it, it engaged him. And so he literally spent hours trying to figure out the rules of the game. Mm -hmm. My point being is, you know, you always hear that, uh, you know, for, especially from teachers that, you know, that, that uh, kids are having trouble in school or they're not engaged. And I think a lot of it is the way the, the, the material is presented. And, and you, know, you said gamification works, and that's a real common thing for people to say, but a lot of games, and Maria was saying this earlier, are horrid. You know, they're yes. basically electronic yes. flashcards. <laughs> so right. for me to say, what's three times six? And if you get it right, here's a monkey eating right. a banana. I mean, that might amuse a student for about a, second. a minute. Yeah. But then they're not going to do that over and over and over to the same extent as you're being attacked by wolves and you're a kid. You can only hit a wolf about once every five times, which, you know, that makes sense because if you're a kid, you're probably not going to be hitting a wolf there. Right, right. And now you chased up a tree, you know, how many arrows do you need somebody to toss to you from the other tree so you can shoot these wolves? And if you run out of arrows, you're stuck in the tree and eventually you fall out and die and get killed by the wolves who have rabies <laughs> and, and so that sucks. Yeah. So good gamification takes a long time and is very expensive. Yes. So that's why we spent the first three years developing and testing the games. Well, I was, and one thing that I think is really important when we talk about games and education is failing in education is this really, really bad thing. Kids are terrified of failing. I mean, kids, you know, I, I, I taught college class and I, kids come in and say, well, if we just can't, if we do all of our homework, we get a B, right? And it hadn't, they didn't care how they did on it. The idea was you just had to get this certain grade. Right. The answer was not in my class, but uh, <laughs> you know, th but this idea was there's this terror around failing and there's yes. an unwillingness to even try to improve because all you really care about is this passing. But you look at video games and a kid will play a video game like 90 million times and I'm only slightly exaggerating to right. get a quarter of a level further and mm -hmm. they will fail and they will fail and they will fail and they will fail and they will go back and try again and try again and try again and they're not doing that when it comes to math in this country but we thought if we can do that and we can make that actually happen which is what we're getting kids to do in our games that's really where you're going to start to make those differences. So it's it's the engagement, but it's also these things that you're doing in games, the resilience, the persistence, the desire to continuously improve to to get better in advance that we can bring into it as well. You know, this fear of failure that we have around education, I think also stems from, from the educational side because there's so much pressure on the teachers to either minimize failure in the classroom or reduce failure in the classroom that they themselves, I think, uh, we call it spread that fear and, and so uh, it's interesting that you brought that up but it, it's so true that that again you can teach people how to be resilient how failure is okay how you know struggle can be fun because ultimately those are real world skills in business in life in a relationship you have to deal with all of those 
Uh, all right, so here you are, you're four years old now. What has been some of your biggest aha moments as a startup? So then maybe something that you didn't expect or maybe, uh, uh, I don't know, so, some of your biggest aha moments or maybe it was a big obstacle that you didn't think that uh, you would have to face or surprised you? Anything come to mind? Well, hindsight's always twenty twenty, of course, but one of the things that I was not prepared for how big of an obstacle inertia is to getting in schools. Mm. So a lot of people will agree if they look at our games and, oh my gosh, this is great. This is so much better than what I've got. But to get into some districts, you need to go through many, many levels of bureaucracy. And even those where you don't, we have a situation where people satisfy us. So mm. I've got, my class is going okay. I know that your game might be better, but I have my lesson plans done. I've already got this installed on all the computers. So that difficulty of overcoming inertia. <clears throat> and then the other thing is that just like we were talking about with movies, sometimes it's not so much having a better product but having a hundred million dollars of marketing to throw out. Right, have better marketing. Right. right. And even not necessarily that the marketing is great, but they have all those boots on the ground. That if I'm a huge company and I'm going in and I'm selling my textbooks and I'm selling projectors and I'm selling smart boards and I'm selling all of these things, I've got a sales rep that you know. They've been coming to your school for five years. They've been you know, having you to their VIP events that they hold at the conferences. And so, when they come in, it's easier for them to get a meeting with you, it's easier for them to talk to you. So breaking through that inertia, even when you have a really good product, I knew that that was gonna be difficult, but the challenge of overcoming the huge textbook publishers, the huge um, companies that have literally $100 million budgets when you're a startup, the people have said, oh, just put a video on YouTube and it'll go viral or you know, get some celebrity to endorse it. And seriously, how many times do you see some celebrity saying, oh, I played this game with my kids. You go, that's it. That's Damn, it. Let's I'm, do it. I'm, I'm, I need one of them. No, it's, it's much, much harder than people think and it takes much, much long, longer. And so I knew that was going to be an obstacle, a long, hard slog. But sometimes in the middle of it, I thought, Damn, I didn't think it was going to be this, this long yeah. and this hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's interesting because I think that's the number one thing that people say in business. I didn't think it would take this long or this much money or, you know, and, and that inertia thing, it, it, it's crushing mm -hmm. because it is. Uh, and, and, you, and you brought up an interesting fact that where you have that, that uh, complacent mindset, you know, I like your stuff. I could see that it's better, but... <sighs> I gotta, I gotta, you know, deal with all this change, and I already have, like you said, my lesson plans made up, and I'm just gonna wait until next year. I'm just gonna put you off as much as I can because I don't want to make that decision today. Well, and both teachers and parents are busy. Yes. You know, 90% of the kids that play our games are between grades three and eight, so eight to 14 years old. Their parents are busy. They're taking them to soccer and they're getting them dinner and they're running out buying school supplies and they have a job, most of them. And right. So they've got so many things going on. The same thing with teachers. They've got lesson plans to write and papers to grade and IEP meetings and parent teacher associations and all the kids in their class that have their own individual needs. So I don't want to give the idea, oh, teachers are lazy. That's not true at all. It's teachers are busy and yeah, they're, they're so. Over, in some cases, overwhelmed. Yes. yes. They're, so, they're working so hard. And even if they're wonderful teachers and want the absolute best for their students, and even if they say, oh, I should do that, I know so many really great teachers that will say, you know, I know I should have your games in the classroom, I know, I know, but I'm so tired and I've got, you know, 20 papers to grade and I've got this play to put on, I've got this thing to do. So it's getting into that very limited bandwidth that everybody's got, whether right. you're a teacher or a parent. Well, you know, I always tell, you know, I have five kids and I always like to explain to my kids that I'm, you know, I'm exhausted with three. I'm a rat. <laughs> <laughs> well, and to just to, just to, just to see the results, I used to have a lot of hair. <laughs> now I just have a lot of kids. <laughs> so, okay, Maria, you've been with the company how long now? Uh, four years. Four years as well. Mm -hmm. And anything that sticks out to you, any big obstacle or aha moment or something that that. Right. Wait. 
say you you talked about the challenges, which I think is really great. One thing I want to talk about is one of the things that I think has been a positive thing and really has broadened kind of our horizon, and it's understanding that your market may be much bigger than you think. You know, mm. so many times people come in and they say, oh, you know, you should be looking for a niche, and you know, because uh, uh, granted there's products that are like, I will solve all of your problems. You have a fever, I'll take care of that. That's you right. Need <laughs> you got it, you know. Um, but we came, we started looking both, one, at school sales, and two, at kind of rural tribal communities that's what we were focused on, on solving. And then we started getting people saying, well, I know you're saying you're building these games for schools, but can we buy them? Because, you know, I would like them for my kid. Um, and so the first answer was yes. If you have ten dollars, you can totally buy it. <laughs> um, so that was one. And then two, we like I said, we started. We our first games um, focused on Native American history and a kind of a cultural um, element. And we started getting people saying, well, can we play them? And we we thought it was going to have to be kind of for schools in those areas where those communities were. And then we started getting requests from schools out here that were you know Indian uh, serving Indian students, but maybe different tribes. And we started getting requests from schools that were you know in the inner city in LA that probably have zero Native American students, and they were asking them, and we were saying, one, they said, well, you know, it covers the math, which right. is the big need that we have. Um, it's actually an educational component as well. It's not, you know, aliens falling from the sky, or it's actual history as well. So there was this kind of broadening to us saying, wow, it wasn't just the audience that we built these for, and that's obviously, you know, a key part of it, but there's a much broader audience to what you're doing. And for us, I think that was much more effective than if we came in saying, okay, we're going to build a game that will fix, you know, math as a whole in this country, but really to say, okay, we've created this thing, it works, and then to say, wow, there's a lot more people that want it than we thought, which I think is a good problem to have. It's a great problem to have, absolutely. All right, so you and I have been talking uh, quite a bit about one of your biggest challenges, which again, it's, it falls under that marketing umbrella, and that is the sales uh, hiring and firing and training of salespeople. And, and so this has been one of your big challenges. Talk about that a little bit. Um, you've had a couple of salespeople, and so kind of give us your experience. Well, one experience we had is common to a lot of startups. So if you have a startup and you're listening to this, be forewarned, you go out and you hire somebody who comes from a big company. And they've had a lot of success in sales in a big company. They come really highly recommended. They're a hard worker, smart person. And you hire them and they don't succeed. And I've heard this same story from everything from startups that were selling beer to startups that are selling video games. And often that person has the experience of sales with that $100 million marketing budget behind them. Right. They come in and somebody knows what Acme Corporation is and what they do, and they've probably already sold to them before. So I think that was one mistake we made early on, that it's often a very different situation selling for a startup than right. selling for a, you know a top 100 corporation. And so I think that's one thing. I think another is you get people that come in that they don't have experience in sales. Well, we're a startup, and often when people do a startup, nobody has experience in that thing. Right, you know, it's a new right. thing. It's a new thing, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're one for giving people opportunities, but uh, sales is hard. Yes. And often people underestimate it because unlike, say, being a software developer, you don't need a degree in computer science. You don't need to show that you have, you know, created databases and, and done 3D programming before. So a lot of people think, well, how hard can it be? <laughs> right, right. Now, I don't think that. But, um, it, but people do think like that. Right. Hey, it's, it's just, you know, just go grab a salesperson. It, you know, they're everywhere. But I've even had people say, oh, your games are so good, they'll sell themselves. Yeah, oh, I love that one. That's a great myth. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Yeah, you know, and, and what's interesting too, uh, one of the other things that I've seen, and I've seen this with big corporations as well as, you know, sm uh, small to middle-sized corporations, is you can get a salesperson um, that is really good. And, and, and for example, I had a, a newspaper client uh, who was well-established. They were 20 plus years old, so uh, in their original newspaper uh, company, and they could bring people in from let's say another media outlet or even another newspaper, and you would have two people, same exact experience uh, or background, and go through the exact same training, and one will be successful and, and one won't be successful, and yet the one who let's say was not successful will, will go to another media company, and then they will explode or soar in that company. Sometimes there is a personality 
um, you know, a culture that works well with that salesperson's personality that maybe doesn't work well with another. Um, interestingly enough, I remember specifically there was a young lady that's, that was having, she could not, she, you know, the, the sales uh, department was open at 8 a.m. and she could never make it. At, she, could, be, yeah, she could be. never make it at 8 a.m. And so after a while, I mean, she was ultimately terminated. And so that kind of woke her up and she ended up working, uh, going to work for a radio station and their, and their sales meeting started at 7.30 in the morning. Oh my God. And she was the number one salesperson there or number two and she had a, a great record. It just, I don't know if it just woke her up, she connected more with those people. It was, you know, maybe, I, I don't know, but it just, there is a personality component to it uh, with all salespeople, and, and so that becomes part of the mix. So you have a startup, and, and I like what you pointed out, where you know your brand's unknown, your systems aren't created yet, and this salesperson is kind of thrown in this mix, and it's again kind of like what you guys are doing. They're wearing multiple hats, less than you guys are, but still they're they're having to figure things out. Well, uh, the the other thing that I think we needed to figure out for ourselves and now we have is in a startup you need a sense of urgency this mm -hmm. is not a big company right and no one else is going to pull your weight so i think over time we've come to realize you don't give somebody six months you give somebody three months you give somebody a month because often those warning signs are there early on yes but you think, well, you know, it's a long sales cycle in, in education. And so I think we've come to see that with every new hire, there's a shorter and shorter period of, it'll be evident if you're gonna fit in or not. I think one of the things in a startup that is, do you feel that sense of urgency? Right. Do you feel like I need to make these sales or we need to build these games and get them out? It can't be, oh, we'll, you know, we'll kick it down the road. I'm getting paid a salary, so I don't have any pressure on me. Exactly. Well, and I was reading an article the other day, and there was a quote in there, and the woman saying, you know, we like to hire slow and fire fast. And somebody yes. else had said, oh, that's such a terrible thing to say, because you hired slow, so you brought these people along through this whole process, and then you fire them, right? But from a business perspective, that's what you need to do sometimes. Yes. It's not, yeah. you know, we have said, and we've talked about this before, very rarely do you say, boy, I'm pretty sure this person is absolutely not going to work out and then they turn everything around and they do. It's basically, and so we've kind of got to the point where we realize when we realize that it's not gonna work out, we just say, okay, it's mm. not gonna work out and cut it. And, and it's hard, I mean, nobody likes firing people, nobody likes things, but we've learned that that's the best thing to do and when you do that, every time you do it, they go, okay, that was the right decision and that's yep. how you know. Yeah, I, and I like that, absolutely. You know, everybody feels relieved, including the person who gets terminated. 90% of the time they're like, oh, you know what, it, it worked out great. You know, the other way, you know, when, when you can do this with salespeople, you can say, hey, we're gonna take you off salary now, and you have to do it 100% commission, and either they terminate themselves, and very, very small percentage will rise to the challenge. A tiny percentage, right? A sliver of percentage will rise to the challenge. Most of them will just self-terminate. But you know what? I think that uh, when it comes to salespeople, one of the things that to me is a key indicator is, you know, how are they prospecting, right? So look, you can, you can send out a bunch of emails. You can make a bunch of phone calls. Uh, depending on your business or product, you can go out there and, and knock on doors. But the great thing about what you guys are doing, and, and this goes to, I think, a lot of companies, is that it's all indoor sales. It's email and telephone. And so you can you can look at it and say, hey, how many phone calls did you make? I made 10. Well, that's not gonna do anything. I mean, you need to make hundreds of phone well, calls, especially if you have a long sales and cycle. I think you need to have the right attitude. Uh, mm -hmm. Someone, I had asked them, this is someone who worked for us a long time ago, I, I'd ask, well, did you contact this person? Well, I contacted them a week ago. Well, did you contact them? Well, I don't want to bother people. If you think that calling up people and telling about your product is bothering people, then you are in the wrong company. Yes. Because I truly believe, and I, my, you know, Maria, Dennis, and I founded the company, we all left really good paying positions to start this company. So I really believe that what we're doing is going to make a difference for kids. It's going to make kids who may have fallen behind in math stay at grade level who may have gotten discouraged in school, drop out, stay in school, that's gonna change people's lives. If you think that that's bothering people, come up and tell them it, you need to work elsewhere. Yes, that should be part of the training process. This is our attitude. Mm -hmm. 
because, I, and, and I totally believe what you're saying, if you believe in your product, if you think your product has that kind of an impact, then you're not bothering people. You're saving right. people's lives. You're, you're helping, as you said, having that child stay in school and maybe you know, impact their entire family. That is an urgent matter. And, and, it, and, it's, you know, and it's not a matter, you know, and if I believe in something, I will call somebody two or three times in a day forget it in a week i mean i'll you know i want them to so two or three times a day might be much and like you didn't get it the first time right well absolutely that's what i mean i mean obviously obviously if i if i got now can i do it now can i charge a card i'm sending you the invoice I said, yeah. uh, that may not be so bad either but no i just mean if, if you're not getting a hold of them if they're not responding man you know you got text you got email you got phone calls there are so many ways of doing it uh, any, any thoughts and, on and your side? And that's the thing that drives me crazy too. <clears throat> I feel like we're in this email driven world. So yes. it's like I email them. I'm like, pick up the phone. Right? Yes. Like, pick up the phone. That's how you get people. If you can't get someone to get back to email, call them and then call them again. And then, you know, like I said, we're not saying call them 45 times in a day, uh, you know, but do it more than once. It's not just I email them, then I email them again. Then call them because how many people get 9 million emails I'm, and you think maybe I want to get back to that person? but you don't get a chance to because right. it falls under the other 9 million emails. So right. actually taking that next step and calling someone on the phone, it seems so obvious, but it surprisingly doesn't seem I to be. literally right. get a thousand emails a day. Yes. So if I'm gone somewhere, like a lot of times we'll work in fairly remote areas and, and internet is limited, and I get back four days later, I will have 4,000 email messages. And so I might go through and out of those, a lot of work, can you do this, can you, I just automatically delete them. There might be some, I think, oh, I should get back to that guy, that sounds good. But then I don't because I have 4,000 email messages. Maybe you sent me another email a week later, that I might get back to you. And that's, that, like I said, that sense of urgency is one of the things that, that I think people have to have to be in sales. And a lot of people talk a good game. They're good yeah. at talking, the, like, like I was saying, you know, if you don't believe that this is something will raise kids' math scores, that will make it more likely that kids will stay in school, make it less likely they will hate school, make it more likely that eight-year-old will have a good day. Right, If right. you don't believe that, you should be elsewhere. A lot of people are like, oh yeah, I really believe in this product. But if you really believe in this product, you would be picking up that phone and calling 50 people today. You wouldn't think it was too tough. If I looked at how many emails you sent today, because I, I do send emails, right. but I, because people have different ways preferring to be contacted, but if you sent two emails today and called one person, you don't really believe in it. You know, you need to walk the walk. That's right, that's right. And you know what, even, even uh, this happened to me the other day, um, a client sent me a, uh, an agreement, a signed agreement for a, a fairly decent uh, consulting job, and I didn't see it. And if it wasn't for the client recent saying, hey Bert, I haven't heard, you know, I've sent you the agreement, I haven't heard from you, I would not have known. I mean, I dropped the ball because I didn't get back to him, but he had sent me the assigned agreement like Monday, but it was like three o'clock in the afternoon, my time, and I don't know what I was doing. You have two but three. I, 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 I'm down to the last two, all right? So I have twin girls at home, which doesn't make it any easier, but anyway. But bottom line is, and, and luckily he contacted me again Monday, uh, Tuesday, the next day, and said, hey, I haven't heard from you in 24 hours. Dude, I'm so sorry. I mean, I, I just cannot believe. My point being is that sometimes an email that we want, an urgent email that we really want, gets lost. Mm -hmm. As opposed, you know, and then of course there are the hundreds or maybe even thousands of emails that we have no interest in or very little interest in that we could care less about. It's easy to get lost. Right. So, so yeah, I love what you said. Email's fine, but. I love phone call, man. Get on there and say, "Hey, did you get the email? Oh, great! I'll send it to you again. Do you want me to text it to you? <laughs> uh, you know, and, you know. Back in the day, I don't know. Some some of these people watching aren't going to even know what this is. But back in the day, you would make a phone call and send a fax. Mm -hmm. And we have a fax machine out there. I don't know why, but we have one. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I tell you what's what's interesting is, again, it's it's this generational shift. So I had my son. Uh, this is uh, he's 28. My other son is 28. Um, I'm sorry, 27, and so at the time he was 23, so this is, uh, whatever, five years ago, six years ago, and he, I was having him send out some faxes, and he calls me up, so I, ha I had to leave the office, he calls me up, says, Dad, fax machine's not working, and I said, well, I know it's working, because we received faxes, plus I sent some this morning, and, he's, and he says, well, it's not working, I said, 
did you know how one plus the number? He goes, no, that's stupid. Why would I ever do that? Who would ever, who would ever dial one plus the numbers? And well, yeah, that was back in the day. You know, we all worked on chalk tablets. You know, you had to do one plus the number. My point being is that, uh, you know, there's a whole generation of people who've never used a fax machine, who've never dialed one plus the number. That's funny. It's true. Who've never even licked a stamp. So, all right. I, I do believe, though, you mentioned the concept about you hire slow and you fire fast. Absolutely, I think it's the way to go. Um, you gotta, especially when you have a startup budget, mm -hmm. every day that you gotta pay somebody who's not being productive is so expensive. Right. But I would say it's, it's hard too, though, because it's hard because yes. when you're looking to fill a position, you really wanna fill it fast because yes. you need somebody in there. And so it's one of those, you know, pieces of advice that you hear and you're like, that's a really good one, but you have to remind yourself right. repeatedly to take because, you know, like I said, we've gotten, better at it but it is it's that dynamic of like you just want someone in there to start helping because you need all you know you're starting to have a small budget but you also have a small number of hands that right. are trying to do yes. a lot of things so it is i think of making sure you really have the person's the right fit but yeah like i said you know if the time comes that you've realized they're not the fit then there's no point in dragging it out it's just right. like any bad really yeah it's just like any bad really like <laughs> i like the way you snuck that in there just no, like any from right. i'm happily married but I, you know <laughs> But she's people heard, heard. She's heard about it. Yeah, we've heard about those people. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that, that's very true. All right. So as a startup, let me ask you this. Have you guys um, systemized, you know, your different departments, even though I know that you guys wear like 17 hats each? Do, do you, have you gotten to the point where you say, okay, this is the way we do things. This is our, you know, what do you call it? Our, our uh, uh, processes. Have you guys started mapping those out yet? We have been getting better and better at it. I mean, it's an evolving thing, yes. but we've been getting better and better at it. So, well, I was just—I think we're far further along in that on our software development process than we are in sales and marketing because we started. You know, games take a long time and are very right. expensive to make, so we've spent three years doing the development and just recently got into the sales cycle. So, as far as development, we're building those processes and working on them. As far as sales, we're doing that, but. I think we're learning as we go, which is kind of the definition of a startup. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's kind of an evolution. Like every time it's like, oh, we're going to do this. And now, you know, every time you, you realize we should have done that, so now you start to put it in place. But unfortunately, too often you realize we should have done that after you should have done that. <laughs> well, you know what? And it goes back to, let's see if I get this right, you know, um, success comes from experience. Most experience are bad. <laughs> right? I mean, you learn from your experience, right? I mean, you know now, hey, we're not going to do that anymore, right? I mean, it, it only has to happen once, hopefully, no, you know, no more than twice, and you realize, you know what, let's not do that again. Let's, let's figure out a system so we can avoid that mistake. And that's unfortunately the way a lot of our successes are done, right? I mean, I felt sorry for our first kid because he was completely nothing but trial and error by our, you know, by our second kid. We had a little bit of experience by our third kid. You know, we thought we, you know, we were now real parents, it, but when you're doing business startup, yeah, that's exactly the same way. It is all trial and error. And, and especially when you are, again, wearing those 17 hats, sometimes you don't have time to uh, do the post-mortem and say, what did we learn from that? Just for the record, my uh, first kid was amazing. Yeah. Oh, is that right? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I think first children are. Best. are the best hey <laughs> i'm not saying that my first child wasn't the best i'm just saying i felt sorry for him because he was trial and error right, <laughs> we had to do all the experimenting they, they come on through adversity to be amazing people <laughs> That's right. you know i i think when you talk about failure everybody's going to have those failures yes uh, this kind of goes back to judo which maria kind of gets tired sometimes about how everything relates back to judo but you know i won the world judo championships and a friend of mine who was the director of development for the country at the time, no one from the U.S. had ever won before. So he said, I went back to all of your tapes. Yes, back then we had like Super 8 tapes, the VHS maybe if you were yeah. really well off. So he said, I went back to all the tapes that I could find of your matches and I watched to see what was different about you than all those people we had before you that didn't win. And he said, you won a lot of matches and I saw a few matches you lost and I never saw you lose the same way twice. Mm. And he was right because it aided me so much. I would go back and say, you know, what happened? What did I do that I never will do that again? And I think that's what we've done with this company, that with each person, say, 
or strategy or campaign or whatever that maybe didn't work out for sales and marketing and say, okay, well, what could we do differently the next time? So even though we haven't gotten to that million dollars a year in sales yet. Yet, I like we're, that, absolutely we're yet. We're getting more and more of a knowledge base and selling like last month was our best month sure. to date. And we're started off pretty well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, right. we're on track to beat that this month, so. Perfect. I like that. Yeah, anybody who wants to um, buy games, www.7generationgames.com. Sevengenerationgames.com, sevengenerationgames.com. All right, since you brought up judo, I'm glad you brought this up because I, I was going to bring it up. So, because. <laughs> She's going to roll her eyes. Yeah, well, you know, it, it, it's important. I mean, look, I, what a lot of the, I guess, uh, tenaciousness that I learned, I learned from two different places. A, from sports. Prior to sports, I learned it from long lines at the immigration department. And so being an immigrant, uh, my, my mom would take me and the kids down there because we had to go through all this process. And it was never an easy process. It wasn't, you know, like you had an appointment. It was you get there early in the morning and you wait and you had to be tenacious and you had to ask and you had to ask and you had to ask. And, and, and then I, I was able to, uh, later on in life, I was able to see the magic and all the different things that I learned waiting at the immigration office. Thank you guys. Um, but, <laughs> but also in sports, there's a lot of, you know, uh, I think that's the magic in sports. And I think that some of that magic is being stolen because we give away so many participation trophies and nobody can lose. Give me your thoughts on this. Well, I never got any of those trophies because that was before my time. Same here, yeah. I think for really small kids, yes. like, you know, Maria had a daughter who's, when she was four, competed in soccer. I think when you're four, that's fine. Yes. Um, a friend of mine runs a tournament, a novice tournament, and they have a lot of little kids at their first tournament, and he also owns a trophy company. So every kid gets a trophy or a medal because he said, that first time you go out there to stand on that line and show what you're made of in a sport, you know, even if you're only five, then another five-year-old could knock you down. That deserves a medal. Yeah. So I think there's a place for it, but it's like little tiny kids and maybe the first time they did something really hard. Right. But yeah, I don't think 12 year olds should be getting participation trophies. Yeah. I, I think you can always find something to reinforce that's true and positive. And I've taught for many years, and you know, and that includes in math. When I grade student papers, I don't give everybody an A, but I try to find things they did right as well as wrong. So I will say, you know, you set up the problem correctly. You correctly identified the the variables you needed to use. However, you you, know, you did the wrong operation. And so when I, we play in our games, I actually program that in. Mm. So I try to look at what do really successful teachers do, and they don't always say you're right, but they will point out why you were wrong, and they will give you a second chance. And we didn't, I didn't come up with all this brilliant stuff by myself. We worked with a lot of teachers over the years. Okay. And I think really good teachers and really good coaches are very similar. Yes. That both of them will identify what you're doing incorrectly, They'll tell you in a way that's not discouraging. They will give you another chance. And so, for example, like in our games, if you, there's a problem, like I mentioned the one with wolves, you know, you're up in a tree and there's um, seven, you know, seven wolves, wolves and five arrows. Uh, and it, how many do you need? And if the student says 12, then the program will pop up and say, did you maybe add instead of multiply? Mm. In our, one of our games, um, Aztec that teaches fractions, there's a, uh, you can get extra points by doing quizzes. So there's, there's one that says, you know, if you had, you ate so much of the, the so many fractions, you know, two twelfths of the pie, your mom ate three twelfths, and how much is left for everybody else? And if you say five twelfths, it'll pop up and say, actually, that's how much you ate. The question was how much there was for everybody else. So a good coach, a good teacher identifies what you're doing wrong and tells you how to correct it. They don't say, no, you're wrong, that's stupid, you failed, you lost. Right. But they don't pretend that you won. Right. They don't pretend that you got it right. So I think there's a line between participation trophies and the other end, the screaming parent that wants to take their eight-year-old and tie a concrete block to him and have him run 10 miles. Right. You know, I have people ask me all the time, how do I make my kid 
you know, a champion. I want to do this. And I'll see them running their eight, nine, ten-year-old kids harder, far harder than I've run any of mine. And Maria was in college track. Julia's in college soccer. Rhonda was in two Olympics. I mean, all of those, you know, there's a tiny percent of kids who make it, in co who make it to the college level in sports. There's a tiny, per tinier percent of people in the Olympics. So I think my kids have been successful in that. They've right. also been successful academically. And I didn't go and say, oh, boop, beep, beep, you fell down. Maria can vouch for that. <laughs> but I also didn't make them get up every morning, no matter what Maria and Rhonda wrote in that book, <laughs> and, you know, carry me on their back up a mountain. <laughs> Both ways, uphill in the snow, right? That's right. Well, you know, and something that you bring up, which, which I think a lot of parents miss this. I was talking about this earlier today when I was stuck in LA traffic. And I did a Facebook Live because I was in traffic for two hours and so just to blow off some steam, there's like a 30 or 40 minute Facebook Live episode of me stuck in traffic and just rambling. So. We do a Facebook Live every Wednesday, but ours is a little more fun. We do 15 <laughs> minutes of um, whatever Wednesday. So whatever questions people send us in on Instagram Live or Facebook Live, we take the most interesting ones and answer them. Oh, that's cool. I like that. I like that's a great way to connect with your audience. All right, so let's talk about money because you, in, uh, earlier in the show we were talking about how you got started, you got funded, and now you you're four years later, you're ready for some more money. And first of all, let's talk about crowdfunding and some of your experience with Kickstarter and things of like that. Yeah, so very early on, uh, we've done two Kickstarters. And early on, we looked at that as a way, one, to bring in money, to kind of do for game club, it's basically pre-sales more or less in some ways, and marketing, because it actually is a way where you are getting your name out there, you're pushing people right. to do it. Um, so we did it. Uh, the one thing that people, I think, don't understand about a lot of these crowdfunding campaigns that they have not done them is they are life consuming. Like you're like, oh, we'll pull it together, we'll do the video, we'll have a couple things that'll go out, we'll tweet it out, and that's it. No, like every single minute of your life, and I think both campaigns we did, we set them to be three weeks, and uh, for, for both of us, we were the main people that were doing it, it felt like every single waking minute of our life was like that Kickstarter campaign. Now, we brought in money, we brought in um, some of the most successful educational video games uh, the Kickstarter's ever had, um, which is not to say in line with what their actual some of their other non-educational games have brought in, but we right. did all right. Um, but it was every waking moment of our life. You're worried about, first you're worried about, will you hit that amount? Because you want to give yourself a, a big enough amount that's going to be worth it, but you know you don't get the money from Kickstarter if you don't actually hit that goal. Ah. Um, but and we intentionally went with Kickstarter for that, because I think too, if, you, if people see it's either all or nothing, you're going to be, one, you're going to be more driven, and people are going to back it more than, They'll get money, whatever. Anyway, right. so we we did do it, but it was like I said, it, it kind of like she was talking about with grants. I think people seem to think, oh, this would be an easy, good way to get money, and and it is a good way, but it is far from easy. Yeah. And I looked into some of the statistics, and I don't remember all of them because I wrote a blog about them, of course, because I'm not being a statistician. But somewhere around half of Kickstarter projects get funded, but out of those, the vast majority of them for five thousand dollars or less. So you're not mm. talking a lot of money. Where for us, you know, we're looking for fifty thousand dollars, so a small fraction of them hit that amount of money or more. So they tell you about the ones that raise millions. Of sure, dollars, sure. But most of them are raising five thousand, ten thousand, and we were raising fifty thousand, which was a pretty ambitious goal, and we hit it. Um, in fact, we we made more than that. And you might say, well, raising fifty thousand three weeks is really good, but like Maria said, it sucks up all of your time, and then you, if this was to develop a product, Forgotten Trail, so. It, it was a good way to get the word out, and it kind of goes back to what we were talking about, about, I don't want to bother people. Right. I had a good friend of mine, and we felt like we'd been spending every minute, you know, posting on Facebook and tweeting out, emailing people, and I said, how come you didn't back on Kickstarter? Because it's like a really good friend that you could ask somebody about. Right. And he goes, I never saw it. I oh, said, my goodness. And what we, a great lesson. Well, we were putting on Facebook all the time. He says, look, I got kids, I run a business, I maybe get on Facebook for 10 minutes at the end of the day to see what people are up to. And I might scroll back through, you know, the last hour or so. But if it didn't come up in that, you know, hour that I was on there or before, I didn't see it. Yeah. And, you know, I might have sent him one email, but it got lost in his email. And so, yes, that was a really good lesson for me. Yeah. You know what? That's amazing. I'm glad you brought this up. Social media is so noisy now. Uh, so I started an experiment. So I used to I used to put out a tweet 
I think I was tweeting like three times a week. And then I was doing it every day. Um, and, and of course I would get like a follower every now and then and somebody would occasionally like something. Um, and then uh, I started doing it three or four times a day just to see, I wanted to see how many people would fall out or you know, people would cuss me out. Oh. None of that, none of that. Now I am up to, and, and I use, uh, I use an, uh, uh, one of my employees and Hootsuite and we put out a tweet every five minutes. So I thought for sure people were just gonna like fall out, right? I mean, it, but. I follow you on Twitter and I never noticed that. Cause yeah, I might check Twitter three or four times a day. Three or four times a day. And so interestingly enough, okay, so I, I, I've gained like, since I started this experiment, I've gained like 200 followers. Um, and, but here's the, here's the really cool part is, I, I checked this, uh, uh, was it, um, Tuesday or Wednesday of this week, and my average uh, impressions for the day went from when I was tweeting, when I was tweeting like uh, three times a week, I was getting like, you know, a few hundred impressions throughout the week. Now I'm getting like seven to 8,000 impressions a day, a day. So I'm throwing that out there because, you know, with your friend's example there, we think that we are putting a lot of stuff out there and reality is because it's so noisy and people are looking at that information at you know, different times of the day and maybe they just wanna, they specifically are going to Facebook to see what the grandkids are doing and then they're in and out or they're seeing what they're, you know, whatever, maybe it's not the grandkids, maybe it's their kids or whatever. Anyway, so they're in and out, they're in there for a specific time and they missed it. Right. And, and that's so, me. I might be on Facebook 10 minutes a day, if that. Yeah, or yeah. Or at all, yeah. And, and, and I go on Facebook, and usually I'm, I'm checking my, my ads. I'm checking the, client, the ads for my clients. I'm not really scrolling through there um, a lot. I'm on there for, as far as the fun part of Facebook, I'm on there for five or six minutes. The other times, I'm, I'm looking at the analytics to see, you know, what, how things are behaving, right? How, how things are being consumed. So it's very interesting. And, and, and so it just goes to show you that you have to put a lot, you gotta just put it out there a lot. And for your really good friends, you just gotta pick up the phone again, call oh, and say, hey, this is what we're doing, we're raising money. Okay, so, and, and go ahead. That's what I was gonna jump in there and say, that's because when people say that all you need to do is put out a perfectly crafted tweet or so, I think social media is very important, but I think people seem to, in some ways, overestimate both the importance of it and the actual return that you're yes, getting from it. Yes. And I'm not saying don't do it, but it is not the end all be all. And I think we started seeing this shift in recently in marketing about social media being the end all be all, and it's just not. That's right, I'm okay. glad you brought that up. It's a lot of hype, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, that, that picking up the phone with that, that same friend, I knew is a really generous guy and had a really good year. And we, the school year's coming up and we have a lot of schools that are very low income schools you know, in, in really remote areas of the country that could use games being sponsored. And I said, hey, would you like to sponsor a school? I've got this whole long list of schools. I'm heading to the South Dakota Indian Education Association and I'm gonna go to the Wyoming Native American Summit and I think there's a lot of schools that could benefit from these games. Would you like to sponsor one? I'm like, sure. And he, you know, got up, put his credit card on, back to school. Yeah. So it's okay to pick up the phone and call people. And often, like I said, my friend's a really good guy. He had a good year. He's somebody that likes to give back to the community, and he figured if I buy these games for a school, I know that they will actually go there. You guys aren't a scam. Right. So it's having that idea that you really are doing good things, and if you really believe that, it's not hard to pick up the phone, and people are happy to hear from you. And so again, I love that, because I want to reinforce that. If you believe in your product, and if you believe in your service, you're not bothering people. They need to be reminded, they need to, be, they need to hear it two or three times. You know, one of the first things that you learn in advertising when I was uh, when I was first learning about marketing is, and today this is maybe true, or, or maybe it's 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 uh, gotten bigger. But back in the day, this is going 30 plus years ago, they used to say that people uh, that your consumers need to see or hear your ad at least seven times before they recognize. Your ad, not that they're going to buy, not that that they like, know, and trust you, but now they recognize the ad. So, fast forward thirty years later today, maybe instead of seven times, maybe it's ten times, maybe it's you know fifteen times, whatever it is. But that's just for them to see and recognize your ad, not that they're going to take action. Yeah. 
And, and so, um, and, and then back to what we're talking about as far as social media, if you have limited time, social media is should not even be on your list. It should be telemarketing, it should be direct mail, it should be something that gives you a direct result. Social media is, is like you were saying, it's just so overhyped. There's a few out there, maybe a very, very few people who have made it big with social media, but when I've done my homework on it, I can't find where the numbers really come together to support their, their big claim. Um, so if you're a startup, I would stay away from social media as a way of growing your business. It's great for interaction. It's great for maybe brand awareness, but picking up the phone or shooting out some emails or doing some direct mail is going to get you better results. All right. So let's talk about this because I know that you guys uh, are on a schedule. Um, so we're uh, looking to do another uh, what do you call it? Um, seed round. Thank you, seed round. So tell us about the seed round. Who can invest? Okay, we have done, we've actually come really far for a startup and managed to maintain almost all of the equity of the company, Maria, Dennis, and I are the three co-founders. We did one seed round for $240,000 and we raised that in three weeks. Wow. So, well, nice. you know, but the thing, I think the thing with it is you don't just say, oh, we're gonna do this, you know, you talk to people ahead of time and we had a lot uh, we worked with a startup accelerator and we had all of our financial statements down showing, you know, this is where we've been. We have zero liabilities. We have zero debt. You know, we've got all these assets. So when people invest, they get a share of the company. So if you can think about investing in Google or Apple or Electronic Arts or whatever your big favorite company is early on. So to be a, an accredited investor, though, because you asked, do we have something on our website? No, because that's not legal. You can't have, you know, mom and pop, you know, Jones down the street investing all of the ten thousand dollars they've saved up in your company. So right. to be an an accredited investor, I think you need to make a, a minimum of two hundred fifty thousand a year, I think that's or right. have a net worth of five hundred thousand. So we are largely. So that's not a huge amount. I mean, it, it might seem like if you're twenty five years old, but a lot of people who are in their fifties have probably saved up that amount of money. It would have taken her nothing. It would have cost her nothing to put those contacts together. And based on, you know, you guys making a deal, she might have had something. Right. As opposed to she had nothing. Right. And, you know, but anyway, as you said, that's why her startup that she was on folded. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Those are things we say in the back of our head. That's right. All right. So we were talking about seed rounds. And so basically, if you're an accredited investor, you have the opportunity to invest in startups. And most startups, including us, they don't take a thousand dollar investment. So right. the first seed round we did, because it was an earlier stage and I kind of felt like that the people who don't have a hundred million dollars should have an opportunity to, to invest. The lowest amount we took was $5,000, which some of our lead investors said, why would you take $5,000? And I said, for the exact reason, maybe somebody wants to invest in a startup and be an angel investor. And that's, you know, what they've got. So now right. this time around, our minimum is 10,000. And I, I don't. I think it's a great opportunity for people who are not super wealthy, right? But would say, "Wow, if I could have been in early on when Facebook or Google or any of those started up, and put in five or ten thousand dollars, you know, look how much money I would have now." Right. Right. So it's it. We we're really excited about the investors we've had to date. We've worked with a small number of people. Most of them have been people we knew, but some of them came in through the accelerator that we worked with. And it's a combination. Some people, they've made a fair bit of money, you know, maybe not, you know, a billion dollars, but they're doing well and they'd like to be involved in something that's new and exciting. I, one of our investors said something interesting to me. He said, you know, I made probably an obscene amount of money for what I did. He and I, I don't want to say, but they, they did some kind of social media right. thing. And he said, you know, I like to say, oh, we help people communicate. He goes, no, I don't really feel I made the world a better place by making it possible for you to share pictures of your cat. And so investing in your company is a way for me to feel like I did some good. Mm -hmm. And then we've got other people who maybe didn't make as much money, but they, they made enough that they're comfortably retired. And, or, you know, they're comfortably kind of working when they want to, and that it's a way for them to be involved. And some of those people are not only investors, but advisors. And we really like that. 
Yeah. They will call up and say, you know, I made a lot of money in sales and now here's my expertise. I'd like to, you know, not just as an investor, but I'd like to give you some advice. And we love that. Though we've also had investors that say, you know what? I think you might make a lot of money. Here's a check. Here you go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let me know when you're rich. Okay. And we're fine with that too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, but I think we are, have been cautious because, like Maria said, it's a relationship. You're giving up a share of your company. Right. So we do go out and meet with people and say, "Are you interested in investing?" But there are people that we don't take meetings with there's a oh you know there's been a lot of this stuff on, on like sexual harassment in, right. in silicon valley and there's a woman who's a venture capitalist that was giving advice and that she said basically people that you wouldn't want to work with don't take their money don't make money for assholes and that was her exact quote and i thought that was really good it is really good you know it, it, i i'm sure that you guys probably have something like this but it's um i know in many situations that you can have a clause in in your in your investment agreement that if for whatever reason we don't like it, we can just buy you out, right? Yes. Or something along those yes. lines. Because it, it, you know, life is too short and your business, uh, what do you call it, uh, is too young to, as you said, deal with assholes. People, people who are just sucking up your time and you just don't need anything like that. I mean. All the investors we have are great. And yeah, I'm not we, just saying we, that to yeah. suck up to them. They really are, yeah. they really are. Well, you know what, I, um, I, I know that uh, Time is short, and uh, you guys have to get started with your day. And I want to say thank you so much for stopping by. I've had a lot of fun getting to to know about Seven Generation Games dot com, Seven Generation Games dot com, and some of the education games that you put out, and how you're changing the lives for thousands of people out there, and, and eventually millions of people. That's right. Yep. So it's been a lot of fun. I appreciate you guys uh, letting me hang out with you guys. Well, thank you for stopping by. You bet, yeah. you bet. It's good. It's good thank to meet you. you. Yeah. And uh, anyway, guys, we're going to be putting this up on YouTube, and then we'll do some show notes as well. So this will be a lot of fun. So uh, we're going to go um, hang out with Boss Rutten, and we'll catch you guys later. Tell Boss I said hi. I will. <laughs>